The next is about the peripheral neuropathy. Now, peripheral neuropathy is a vague word which, uh, which involves uh, many conditions, in a uh, lar large number of conditions, where the peripheral network uh, tissues, they are affected, their functions are affected with the either organic pathology or without organic pathology. Many times there could be, there may not be any identifiable lesions over the nerves. At times there could be identifiable lesions where there is no uh, actually damage to the nerves, permanent damage to the nerves. Word pati in uh, medical terms means a disease of the nerves. You say very vague word uh, as such. And based upon the presentations, they are classified either as a motor, sensory, or autonomic, or based upon the other clinical presentation, they are also classified as a either mononeuropathy or polyneuropathy. The among the mononeuropathy conditions which are common are medial nerve uh, compressions where it's carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar nerve is tardy ulnar nerve palsy or cubital nerve palsy and radial nerve uh, saturday night palsy, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve where uh, the meralgia parasitica, sciatic nerve, piriformis syndrome and uh, perennial nerve captain charles palsy, strawberry palsy, tubal nerve, uh, tarsal tunnel syndromes whereas polyneuropathy is more common in uh, either hereditary diseases or inflammatory disorder like glian barre syndrome, chronic inflammatory or vasculitis, or infectious diseases like leprosy or HIV infection, systemic diseases like diabetes, mellitus, paraneoplastic and paraproteinemia, drugs like uh, isoniazid alcohol and so on. <coughs> so the causes are many and the varieties of the diseases also are too many. Of course, we will not discuss all these conditions. We will discuss only those conditions which are clinically important. Among these conditions, one of that important condition which is quite frequently seen in the clinical condition is a, what we categorize as a metabolic neuropathy. Metabolic neuropathy is a condition where there is some abnormality of the metabolism and hence as a result of the abnormal metabolic substances, the nerves become uh, either dysfunctional or the functions would be affected with peripheral nerves are involved. Such conditions are uh, called as a metabolic neuropathy. Among these metabolic neuropathy, the most common conditions are diabetes mellitus or persistent hypoglycemia, uremia, hypothyroidism, hepatic failure, polycythemia, amyloidosis, acromegaly, porphyria, and uh, lipid, uh, glycolipid metabolism as such, nutritional vitamin deficiencies and mitochondrial disorders, so on. For the, from the, uh, our clinical interest point of view, we will uh, limit ourselves to diabetes mellitus, then nutritional deficiency conditions mainly and the other conditions of course we will just skip out because they discuss all the issues would be too much as such so we will uh, consider only these conditions which are more frequent from the clinical point of view. So diabetic neuropathy which is quite common and you will be seeing plenty of patients of diabetic neuropathy now and the as per the data uh, about half of the people with the type 2 diabetes develop peripheral neuropathy which comes with the progressive loss of sensation, increased risk of falls, foot ulcers and amputation. The most common clinical presentation of uh, the diabetic neuropathy is a, a feeling of numbness. The most of the patients would say like uh, they feel as if there is some sponge covering over the legs and they are not able to feel that sensation. And uh, the other common complaint is they do not, they cannot make out whether they have worn the footwear or not. So very common, they miss their footwear in the temples or elsewhere once they remove the footwear and then go back, they forget to again uh, put the footwear or they will not feel that and that's the most common clinical symptom which we see. And it's a seen that neuropathy is to be present in more than 7.5% 7, 7 of patients at the time of diabetes diagnosis. This also is quite important. Uh, see, neuropathy is considered as a, a complication of the diabetes, but about 7.5% of the patients are present with the symptoms of neuropathy and when you investigate, you know that uh, diabetes has occurred. And very interestingly, in Ayurvedic textbooks, Karacharana Daha is considered as a Pura Rupa of Prameha 
and many a times this fact is criticized like uh, that's uh, considered as a uh, <coughs> complication now uh, but even now uh, with all the advanced technology and uh, advanced screening methods of diabetes you will have plenty of patients who have developed neuropathy and based upon that neuropathy signs you diagnose the diabetes mellitus which occurs quite frequently and the usual uh, presentation would be half of the cases are symmetric polyneuropathy symmetric in the sense of similar symptoms on both the legs focal syndromes such as carpal tunnel syndrome also do occur in diabetes uh, pathologies cranial neuropathies account a relatively less common conditions but the most common clinical presentation is a numbness or relief the ability to feel the pain or temperature changes and uh, incidence of the symptoms are more common in the lower limb than the upper limb so majority of the patients would have the symptoms in the lower limb where it starts with the numbness or a reduced ability to feel the pain and that reducing the symptoms of the pain itself would be another leading to major complications the major complications could be there is increased risk of ulcers increased risk of fall and uh, the patient uh, may develop the later complications of the diabetes and it is simply because of the neuropathy then <coughs> tingling or burning feeling sharp pains or cramps in the legs muscle weakness extreme sensitivity to touch hypersensitivity also can occur and the serious problem like ulcers infections etc they are the later consequences as such the factors which lead to the development of diabetic neuropathy are not understood completely the exact mecha mechanism is not understood completely and hence there are multiple hypotheses and uh, the hypothesis as per the again based upon the statistical analysis i will not go into that uh, detail of uh, uh, statistical analysis uh, the important facts which are uh, somewhat uh, clinically important are patients with poor glycemic control if the sugar is not controlled properly the patients have a high chance of developing the diabetes mellitus uh, advanced age above 60 the patients tend to have the uh, neuropathy symptoms quite frequently patients with uh, having diabetes mellitus for quite a long time 5 to 6 years or beyond that that also increases the chances of uh, the neuropathy dyslipidemia where the patients have an abnormal lipid level lipid profile is not alter where the lipid uh, particularly high density lipids are more uh, in that condition it can result in a <coughs> the neuropathy smoking increases the chances of diabetes mellitus pathology heavy alcohol intake also then there is a genetic phenotype genetic factors certain of the patients of diabetes mellitus where there is a genetic tendency they also have a higher tendency to have the diabetes mellitus and that genetic gene is hla dr uh, the three or four uh, gene is considered to be responsible patients with the tall height also have a higher chance of developing the neuropathy these are the common conditions the hypothesis about the diabetic neuropathy there are <coughs> many hypotheses and uh, the commonest hypothesis uh, from the chemical point of view polyol pathway polyol pathway is extra glucose which is present in the body is turned into a polyol and that polyol is converted into sorbitol and fructose and these enzymes sorbitol and uh, uh, this uh, fructose fructose is a sugar they reduce the uh, nerve uh, content like uh, myosinositol which is necessary for uh, the uh, activity of uh, exchange of ions and uh, the on that the whole theory of uh, polyol pathway is based upon the aldose reductase inhibitors uh, administered will improve the clinical condition and hence be this uh, hypothesis is believed to be there the other is about the advanced glycation end products during that uh, uh, conversion of uh, glucose the excess of uh, uh, glucose would be reacting with the proteins nucleotides and lipids which results in what we call as glycation products like acetylcholine acid uh, as such and they may have a disruption in the neuronal integrity and they may affect the capacity of the nerves to repair and hence they can affect the pathology the oxidative stress is another of the theory which is now gaining lot of weightage and becoming quite popular increased production of free radicals in diabetes also is known to produce the 
neuropathy and now these days one of the recent trends in the treatment would be antioxidants to be used as such that's about the diabetic uh, uh, neuropathy hypothesis clinically <coughs> based upon their presentations they are categorized again further into hyperglycemic neuropathy generalized symmetrical polyneuropathy sensory neuropathy sensory motor neuropathy autonomic neuropathy focal and multifocal neuropathy superimposed chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy now this again is based upon the symptoms hyperglycemic neuropathy is which is directly related to the blood sugar level in such conditions if the blood sugar level is reduced the patient's condition may improve this constitutes only a few of the patients particularly the patients who are diagnosed as fresh based upon the neuropathy and they are diagnosed as diabetic mellitus in such conditions reduction of the blood sugar level may produce a clinical improvement in the symptoms symmetrical polyneuropathy is usually occur in the later stages in the old age and in that condition again the recovery is comparatively poor sensory neuropathy is where the patient have only the loss of sensation or impaired sensation but motor activity the functions are normal that's the and that condition usually occurs again in the old age patients patients who are hypertensive or atherosclerosis and majority of the patients of this condition also would have an arteriopathy sensory motor is where there would be a contraction of the muscles or atrophy of the muscles and essentially sensory motor pathology would be accompanied with the arteriopathy and in both the conditions the outcome is poor so it's not simply enough if you manage the diabetes mellitus controlling the diabetes mellitus is one of the important target of the management but in sensory and sensory motor neuropathy is that that alone would not be enough autonomic neuropathy produces a wide spread set of the symptoms which we will discuss in detail later on where you will have the manifestations of gastrointestinal tract cardiovascular system pathologies and the uh, even uh, it's related to the bubble and bladder functions which we will discuss in detail later then multifocal neuropathy is where the patient may have uh, lesions of that neuro uh, neuronal uh, conditions either loss of sensation or a uh, impaired uh, altered sensations at different areas of the body spots at some spots as such uh, which may produce some confusion with other diseases but this also is a common condition which is often seen then superimposed chronic inflammatory pathologies where there could be confusion with the diagnosis a patient may present with the guillain barre syndrome like condition whether it is a guillain barre or it is due to the diabetes or so on that kind of a condition cannot be made out now from the clinical point of view the grading of diabetic neuropathy is a stage as a either n1 or n1a n2a or n2b n3 the n is n0 is or n0 is no neuropathy n1a is signs but no symptoms of neuropathy there are uh, like when you examine the sensation the sensations may be slightly impaired but the patient may not have symptoms that's n1a n2a is patient has a symptomatic mild neuropathy sensory or motor or autonomic but patient is able to heel walk patient is able to walk and the patient's daily life is not affected and the majority of the patients come in this category and to a then n to b is severe symptomatic diabetic neuropathy patient is unable to heel walk n3 is severe polyneuropathy disabling where the patient is not able to walk and bear the weight then distal symmetric sensory motor neuropathy is commonly defined according to the following three criteria the patient must have diabetes mellitus consistent with that widely accepted definition so uh, di- diabetes mellitus definition again is varying which we have already referred to it's not simply the sugar level it's about the metabolic activity then c- severity of the polyneuropathy should be commensurate with the duration and severity of the diabetes then other causes of sensory motor polyneuropathy must be excluded because these symptoms these uh, neuropathy can occur due to other conditions to diagnose whether the patient has a diabetic neuropathy or not these criteria are suggested as a standard protocol of the treatment then sensory symptoms usually the onset will be insidious and uh, stalking and glow like sensation which i already uh, referred to and the sensory symptoms could be of two categories negative sensory symptoms or positive symptoms this is what generally is classified negative symptoms is where the patient will have the numbness or feeling as if that part is dead and having that gloves and stalk like appearance 
patient may not have a may be a proper proprioception the patient may not be able to sense the position and hence the patient may have balance of the eyes loss of balance when the eyes are closed uh, which is often again confused with the extrapyramidal pathologies painless injuries due to loss of sensation positive symptoms are the other way where the patient may have a burning sensation pricking pain tingling or electric shock like feelings aching tightness or hypersensitivity to touch these are categorized as a positive symptoms so so usually the description of the sensory symptoms in case of diabetic pathology are categorized as a positive sensory or negative sensory the meaning of that is a positive sensory is where the symptoms are aggravated sensations are aggravated where the patient will have more pain burning sensation tingling etc whereas uh, negative are where the sensation is reduced motor symptoms are again categorized into distal proximal or focal weakness the distal is again more common is distal where the patient would have the symptoms of weakness in the small muscles chin muscles and these distal symptoms are more frequently observed in the upper hand limits like fingers where the patient would not be able to do the fine jobs like turning keys or holding fine object writing etc Uh, the distal uh, neuro uh, motor symptoms are seen later though the patient may have symptoms due to the relatively less obvious clinical presentation they are not seen made out easily in the usual initial conditions but the when you observe you can see that the uh, toes skin in the toes would be thickened due to that abnormal pressure area or there could be some bar uh, corns or warts may be developed corns particularly developed at the pressure area or the when you slap the toe the may produce a weakness feeling of weakness in the foot as such then proximal limb weakness comparatively uh, more common in females than the males where the thicker muscles are involved and in that patient the patient would have the symptoms like um, difficulty in climbing up and down stairs or difficulty in getting up from a seated supine position or the patient may have a falls due to the knee giving away and difficulty in raising the arms above the shoulders so on where there may not be pain there may or may not be pain but the patient would have weakness again these are very commonly seen in uh, usually obese patients uh, again female patients uh, proximal limb weakness or proximal limb motor symptoms are seen and this has to be differentiated from other conditions like arthritis and so on very often they are missed as a arthritis symptoms minor weakness in the toes and feet may be seen severe weakness is uncommon uh, usually uh, in the uh, toes there may not be as much of the trouble in case of the proximal pathology focal weakness is in some areas some areas of the body it could be some finger or at certain zones like there could be reduced movement as such autonomic symptoms as i told you will go into that descriptions uh, the autonomic symptoms could be of different variety like gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy or cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy or bladder neuropathy or pseudomotor neuropathy they are classified into these four categories gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy may present with either dysphagia abdominal pain nausea malabsorption fecal incontinence diarrhea constipation a patient of diabetes presenting with these symptoms you have to investigate rule out the other conditions and then may diagnose this as a gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy uh, these also are common but most of the times these are misinterpreted as some gastritis or so on so usually let's not given sufficient attention cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy would be pre- presented with either sinus tachycardia persistent pulse rate would be quite high Orthostatic hypotension where the patient may feel giddiness in the standing erect position, arrhythmias could occur and uh, the heart rate may not be responding to the breathing or other physical activities. See, normally when you take deep breath the heart rate would be reduced, when you exhale the heart rate will increase. But in a patient of cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy these uh, rhythmic changes may not be seen. Similarly when you do some exercise the heart rate will increase. and when you take rest the heart rate will reduce that's a normal phenomena in a patient with autonomic neuropathy this response may not be as normal 
and they are it could be like patient may have syncope like giddiness in the leg posture in severe conditions so this also have to be uh, identified in a patient with the diabetes mellitus ecg is a better tool to make out these diagnosis like then bladder neuropathy again in a diabetic patients present with the poor urinary stream feeling of incomplete bladder emptying straining to void sexual incompetence heat intolerance excess of sweating also could be the other clinical symptoms then of course uh, that's a pseudomotor that's a, there is a uh, it, it should be categorized under uh, pseudomotor neuropathy heat intolerance and excess of sweating are in the same area and the excess of sweating often in the head neck and trunk with the maybe anhydrosis or absence of the sweating in the lower trunk and extremities <coughs> another very often seen symptom is what we call as gustatory sweating gustatory sweating is a excess of sweating immediately after consumption of the food this also is a common symptom of pseudomotor neuropathy of diabetes location of the neuropathy symptoms could be usually in the lower limbs or in upper limbs this is what we call as a, the uh, proximal or the distal distal and proximal focal or where you will have some spots like ulnar nerve median nerve and so on uh, that's the focal and a cardiovascular or the autonomic nervous system would involve three visceral organs these are the locations of diabetes neuropathy diagnosis clinical diagnosis the act, specific tests done to confirm the diagnosis of a as neuropathy particularly sensory neuropathy is assessing the sensations and assessing the sensations of diabetic neuropathy can be done by either a tuning fork where the vibrations of the tuning fork are assessed or assessment with a filament a coarse or a fine filament and uh, or a, there is a specific instrument called biothesiometer which assesses the sensations as well as the thermal sensation as well as the touch sensation uh, these are now frequently used in specialized diabetic clinics in the routine conditions you may not use that but these are the very accurate methods of diagnosis now of neuropathy tuning fork test has a highest sensitivity of around 99% whereas the coarse filament and fine filament have a sensitivity of 73 to 16% as such and the biosensitivity is around 80% sensitivity that means your diagnosis could be accurate to that level of the percentage and uh, at present there is no treatment is current available to reverse the neuropathy once the neuropathy has occurred there is absolutely no treatment which can reverse the condition the best approach is to control the diabetes and other risk factors particularly muscle weakness is treated with support such as braces physical therapy and regular exercise may help the patients in maintain the muscle strength and uh, they ha have already pain medications uh, can be uh, administered to reduce the pain and uh, specific uh, symptomatic treatment to treat nausea vomiting these are the standard lines of the treatment so the other way the other guidelines the guidelines for treating the diabetes uh, neuropathy would be control diabetes maintain normal blood pressure exercise regularly and uh, stop smoking limit the amount of alcohol intake and if the patient is a consum uh, alcohol consumer this these guidelines are given by the uh, american medical organization association ama guideline it and because that the people consume more alcohol quite frequently then maintain a healthy weight eat healthy diet these are guidelines there is no specific curative treatment as such then diabetic gastroparesis the patient may have a gastric dilatation and uh, a distension of the abdomen and uh, frequent vomiting is now known that a specific treatment which is popular now is a, a erythromycin and metoclopramide are used to treat diabetic gastroparesis vitamin supplementation is being studied to see if that can have an impact recently and uh, one of the study which is coming up and which has now become uh, a com becoming a common prescription is zinc sulfide zinc sulfide showed improvement in glycemic control in 60 uh, patients in one of the study and certain vitamins also are prescribed now these days almost every diabetic diabetologist would be prescribing a zinc sulfide and some vitamins to the patients of diabetes neuropathy based upon this that's a common thing when i deal with the patients of diabetic neuropathy usually my prescription would be uh, to glucose level control by the any of our medicines that uh, 
drugs and medicines for uh, glucose level control. Uh, we have uh, we will discuss on similar context when we discuss about the diabetes simulators in due course of time. Then the other specific medicines in a patient with neuropathy when the glucose is under control is Chandraprabha, Ekangvira, Abhrakatapya, which is usually prescribed. Ashwagandha Garish also is prescribed. Matra Bastri or Radhayapan Bastri are prescribed. Matra Bastri is better in a neurological uh, sensory uh, neuropathies. Yapan Bastri is better in a motor neuropathies. Then the other new coming up experimental therapies, which are now beginning popularity and uh, bit costly drugs which are often used now and maybe many of the patients may have these kinds of the prescriptions are aldosidertase inhibitors, alpha lipoic acid or activagen, one of the new drug which is quite costly and uh, some of the patients already come with that kind of a prescription. Another stimulation, that electrical stimulation of the spinal cord also is blank, being practiced in some health centers. So in due course of time, these treatments may become quite popular and you may have many patients with these uh, presentations. So I may not comment whether these are really effective or non-effective, that kind of a comment may not be possible. But uh, these are the possible future lines of the treatment. Then prognosis is a mortality is a higher in patients who have cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. Diabetic mellitus patients with the cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, the mortality rate is higher and uh, the as per the statistical data, now this is about the stati statistical data, the overall mortality rate over a period of 10 years was 27% in patients of the diabetes and uh, the cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy compared to the 5% mortality rate in those without evidence of the car. So patients who have a tachycardia or that uh, signs of autonomic neuropathy, if they are diabetic, they have a high chance of fatal complications or uh, their expected life period would be shorter. And uh, the morbidity results of boot ulceration, lower extremity amputation are uh, the other way that the incidence is quite high. That's about the diabetic neuropathy in brief. The next type of the neuropathy which we discuss would be alcoholic neuropathy. Again, I have selected these topics based upon how we see the clinical conditions, number of patients whom we see. And the alcoholic neuropathy patients also, the number is quite high now. And it's a, a, a defined as a primary axonal neuropathy, characteristic by value and degeneration of the axons and reduction of the myelination of the neural fibers. Consumption of the alcohol produces a changes in the axons where there will be degeneration and the myelination will be reduced and it is often considered to be the, either due to direct toxic effect of the alcohol or the toxic effect of the acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a, a metabolic product of ethanol. Both of them are toxic. Alcohol as well as acetaldehyde also is a uh, cause for the uh, nerve damage. Then alcohol consumption also results in time in deficiency and hence nutrition deficiency of thiamine also causes alcoholic neuropathy. Now thiamine deficiency and the uh, clinical conditions related to the neurological conditions we will discuss in detail later on which we call as biribiri. So we will discuss that part separately. Then alcohol toxic effects of producing the metabolic neuropathy is a, the major issue which, from our clinical point of view. The clinical presentation would be one is obviously patient would be an alcoholic and the patient may have a diminished sensation to vibration or pin flick stimulation with a stock and glow presentation as in case of the diabetic neuropathy. Again, usually seen in the lower limb more frequently than in the upper limb. And many a times the upper limb also may be involved. The characteristically thermal and proprio sensi sensation are, would be more frequently affected, more seriously affected. So patient may not be able to feel that heat changes there and the patient may find it difficult to maintain the position against the gravity and hence the gait will be very characteristic and a gait which is faltering gait. A alcoholic patient will be walking with a spe specific form of gait which we call as faltering gait where it looks as if the patient is going to fall and that kind of an appearance is produced due to the improper proprietary um, sensation of the uh, foot as such. Then reflexes uh, may be reduced in patients of uh, the, uh, the alcoholic neuropathy because of the axonal degeneration, particularly gastrocnemius and psoriasis muscle reflex, 
uh, would be affected, that knee joint would be affected. Then atrophy of the foot muscles in advanced cases, that's very typical. Typical, uh, uh, the muscles would be atrophied as you see in the diagram, atrophy of the muscles and a partial foot drop, not a full foot drop, a partial foot drop with the abnormal gait and where the patient keeps the foot apart. That's the typical gait which I said. That's it. the clinical presentation asset. And uh, the uh, reflexes are reduced in as the clinical presentation. In a patient presenting with the uh, alcoholic neuropathy, the important investigations which are necessary are glucose profile, liver function test, creatine level. Particularly, thiamine level is essential and vitamin B12 and folic acid levels may be studied. The other investigations which can confirm the diagnosis would be nerve conduction studies to confirm about that impairment of the conduction. The conduction would be slower. Electromyography which produces, which shows a, a uh, uh, mutated response of the contractions as such. Then vibrometer also is uh, one of the instruments which is often used in uh, sophisticated centers. In the routine clinical practice, we may not use these, but uh, glucose levels, liver function tests, creatine level, these are absolutely essential to make the diagnosis. Treatment, of course, the most important part of the treatment is uh, withdrawal. Some of the patients would be improving after withdrawal, but some of the patients, even after withdrawal, they continue to have the symptoms. And uh, in such conditions, again, the standard protocol of the treatment is only exercises, different sorts of exercises where the patient is given training for weight and uh, balance training with the maybe devices like walkers or supports as such. And now certain of the instrument, newer instruments are also available which can help in uh, maintaining that position. Then exercises like stretching, particularly gastrocnemius, soleus muscle stretching, uh, and uh, strength gaining uh, weak, uh, weak, uh, for training for the weak end muscles, we are part of physiotherapy, which is done. I would consider this as uh, the clinical symptoms of the paramada, where the clinical symptoms are Shleshmakshaya, Angaguruta, Virasasiddhacha, Vinmutra Sakti, Atatalli, Arochakashta, Lingam, Parastyashamalese. Paramada is the description of the same, and uh, usually my prescription, once a patient has withdrawn, be, Chandra Prabha, Arogya, Ajani, Kumari, Tailadhar, or Yapanadasri. With that, some of the patients show significant improvement as such, provided they have withdrawn the alcohol. And many times, this improvement is much better than simple exercise protocol. The next important issue which we discuss would be nutritional neuropathy. The nutritional neuropathy is a set of conditions which are produced due to impairment of the nutrition. Alcohol exposure or alcoholism itself is a, a nutritional neuropathy. Uh, now, when I say alcoholic neuropathy and a nutritional neuropathy produced with alcohol exposure, the difference is only that one. A alcoholic neuropathy is a sign of chronic alcoholism, whereas alcohol exposure for a short duration also can produce nutritional neuropathy, where there may not be a, a axonal degeneration. Thiamine deficiency is one of the important. The other varieties of the nutritional neuropathy are niacin deficiency, pyridoxin, cyanocobalamin, pantothenic acid, which are the different B vitamin varieties, alpha tocopherol deficiency, and the celiac disease, where there is a malabsorption, also is categorized as nutritional neuropathy. Among these, we discuss mainly the thiamine deficiency, which is more important. Others will just be casual, will be casual as such. The but usually what happens is in the clinical practice, majority of the patients who have symptoms of neuropathy, the common prescription is a B complex, vitamin B complex is a, uh, given. But uh, uh, the clinically, it is not justified to give that whole B complex set as it. Because a number of patients may have a deficiency of only one of the items like thiamine or niacin and pyridoxine. So, giving a whole B complex may not be the suitable prescription as such. Now, thiamine deficiency or bilibili, which is quite significant, thiamine deficiency can cause two forms of presentation mainly either wet bilibili, where congestive heart failure is the primary symptom, patient may have symptoms of congestive heart failure, or dry bilibili, where the peripheral neuropathy is the primary symptom. Now, wet bilibili presents with the cardiac symptoms where 
the clinical presentation would be uh, different. Now, role of uh, thiamine in the glucose metabolism is uh, quite important for both pentose phosphate pathway as well as the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. Thiamine is an essential substance and uh, if the thiamine deficiency occurs, it can result in impaired metabolism of the glucose, the energy production will be reduced. And the requirement of the thiamine in the normal conditions is a uh, in men it's 1.2, women 1.1, during pregnancy 1.4 milligram, during lactation 1.5, infants 0 to 1 years it's 50 to 55 micrograms and as the age goes up it gradually the requirement increases and by the age of 10 to 18 years the requirement is about 1.1 to 1.3 milligram in boys and 1 milligram in girls. That's about the daily requirement of the thiamine acid. Clinical symptoms of uh, the thiamine deficiency again can be categorized from the point of view of pediatric and adult. See, one is, as I told you, wet and dry. Then the other way is uh, the pediatric and uh, the adult. From the routine clinical point of view, pediatric bilibili is more common, which we see quite frequently, and adult bilibili comparatively less common. And the pediatric uh, uh, belly belly is often produced in the people where uh, they are the children where they are fed only on the breast milk and if the mother is thiamine deficient or the patients who are fed is more common with the, the patients uh, children who are fed with the, the formula milk like uh, were, uh, bottles like or maybe the powders baby food as such and breast milk is not given they have a high risk factor of developing the pediatric conditions the outcomes of a delivery in a young age or in a newborn or in the pediatric conditions, either it can result in a full clinical delivery or it also can produce autism, very one of the very troublesome conditions, or it may produce depression, or the patients may have a typical neurological pathology which is due to the delivery as such. Now, clinical presentation again could be of three categories either acute cardiogenic form which is comparatively lesser then aphonic form which is more common usually seen by about four to six months of old infants that we can see or pseudo meningitic form again comparatively less common so most form common presentation would be of very very in children from the clinical point of view is the aphonic form where the child would be a weeping or the sound of cry would be hoarse, hoarse as such, then a typical sound is produced, uh, very hoarse and then there will be a holding of the breath, there will be no sound produced. That's a sign of uh, the, uh, bit time in deficiency in children. Restlessness, child weeping more, edema and breathlessness and occasionally fatal complications can happen. Cardiac events start with acute colic, anorexia, vomiting, edema, cyanosis and breathlessness and heart failure leading to death, comparatively less common. Then the pseudo meningitic form where the patient may have meningitis like symptoms but not really meningitis would be nystagmus, twitching, bulging fontanelles, convulsions also can occur in very 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 or thiamine deficiency condition. In adults, the clinical presentation can be of different category. Again, they are categorized into wet beriberi and uh, dry beriberi. The dry beriberi is uh, mainly presenting with the neurological symptoms where the patient may have abnormal sensations over the area and there again, it could be like ocular abnormalities where the patient may have uh, vision abnormalities or mental status changes, uh, confusion or many times uh, even uh, impaired behavior, altered behavior or uh, mm, uh, the patient may have a, a abnormality of gait where the patient may have a incoordination of uh, the ab uh, thoracic portions and the lower limb. Patient may feel like a wavering uh, gait as such. Or in still less common signs are like a stuporous patient may have uh, stuporous conditions and semi-conscious hypotension, tachycardia, hypothermia, the total body temperature could be reduced and uh, epileptic seizures also can occur occasionally, hearing loss, hallucinations 
and delayed signs if it is persisting for a long duration the uh, 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 that's uh, the neurological signs occur that's uh, it can result in hyperthermia or uh, it can even uh, a spastic paresis can occur or coma also could be a complication and set of these neurological symptoms are called as a Wernicke's encephalopathy or Korsakoff psychosis. Wernicke's encephalopathy, the whole set of these symptoms are called as Wernicke's encephalopathy. Korsakoff psychosis where the patient would have a impaired mental status and behavioral changes occur. Then the other symptoms could be gastric beriberi where the patient may have abdominal discomfort, anorexia and acidosis. And uh, the subclinical deficiencies, occasionally you may have symptoms where the symptoms are not very conspicuous. The patient may have just a uh, fatty, more tired feeling, mood changes and the pain in the muscles, again not so very constant, often the patient may relate it to the exercises, tendon reflexes may be reduced, impairment of memory, anorexia, tachycardia or decreased uh, uh, this, uh, active, uh, this uh, transpolate activity where patient may have malaise and anorexia and uh, decreased appetite. These are big symptoms which again could be due to the thiamine deficiency. A chronic form is a bit very, very where the patient may have the cardiovascular symptoms due to vasodilatation there could be acute heart failure or cardiogenic shock in very severe acute conditions. In the chronic conditions it could be tachycardia and uh, the patients may have a warm extremities, feeling of warm extremities. Hypertrophy of the liver and spleen, hepatosplenomegaly could be the other clinical symptoms as such. And uh, the blood pressure may be slightly increased. Chest pain also could be the clinical symptom of a wet beriberi. So, identification of the beriberi in clinical condition is a quite important issue. The primary treatment in uh, the beriberi is uh, providing the thiamine. And the best source of the thiamine are these the food substances which are containing the thiamine in large quantities are listed as such the uh, flax seeds, green peas, uh, brown rice, this brown rice is our boiled rice. These have very high content of uh, the thiamine and very very can be prevented by this. In India, there are some endemic areas, very very is in endemic areas. And luckily, the incidence of uh, the beriberi in Karnataka is comparatively lesser. Whereas in the east, northeast, Manipur is one of the area where the beriberi is more common. And uh, mm, uh, the, uh, the uh, our national health program takes special special care about that. So, thiamine deficiency is somewhat endemic. Why it's a endemic is not really known as such. And uh, one of the important is, is uh, in the patients of patients with the muscular weakness and atrophy, that's uh, the dry beriberi, when you administer thiamine, the recovery is uh, slow and majority of the patients may still have some deficits left over of about 25 to 70 percent. Whereas wet beriberi patients, they recover well, they respond well, usually the treatment would be better. Uh, from, from our clinical point of view, we rarely see wet beriberi patients. A few of the dry beriberi patients we do see there, particularly pediatric, more commonly the pediatric. And what I have observed is in pediatric conditions, Kumari as well given would be much better, produces a significant relief than simply supplementing thiamine. Then in adults where the patients have that dry beriberi symptoms like neurological symptoms, Ekangavira or Ashwagandha Rista can help in reducing the symptoms in majority of the patients. This is what I have observed. The next step we will continue with the other deficiencies, mm, pyridoxine deficiency. The pyridoxine is again one of the vitamin B series. The daily requirement is about 1.5 milligram. A pyridoxine deficiency is uh, 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 presents with the symptoms like mainly glossitis, chelosis or ulcers in the mouth. Oral manifestations are the more common. Then the general symptoms like weakness, dizziness. Skin changes, dermatological manifestations like a seborrheic dermatitis can occur and neurological symptoms comparatively rare in adults it could be distal weakness, numbness or impaired vibration or uh, improper sensations also can occur. And neonates it can present as a hypotonia and hypotonia irritability, the tone will be lesser. The important is uh, uh, 
the thyroidoxin a deficiency can produce the neurological symptoms at the same time continuous use of uh, pyridoxine in high doses that's a toxic effect of long term excessive pyridoxine consumption can affect a irreversible change in the nerves and it can present with a pure sensory neuropathy and this is a very important issue and uh, in such patients discontinuation of the pyridoxine can help in uh, making a patient recover a good number of patients recover and uh, few cases completely recover completely as such now from the clinical point of view one of the major problems would be patients having excess of pyridoxine are more common than the pyridoxine deficiency real pyridoxine deficiency doesn't occur quite frequently because most of the food substances common food substances would have enough of pyridoxine and the daily requirement is just 1.5 mg so real deficiency generally doesn't occur in a patient person who has a average diet consumption a supplement of pyridoxine is absolutely necessary when you administer drugs like isoniazid so in the present day situation isoniazid tablets would always come with pyridoxine as a content or penicillin but the other way supply, supplying pyridoxine is not necessary at all that uh, providing excess of pyridoxine itself can be harmful can produce a neuropathy and a good number of patients come with that kind of situation where vitamin b complex that like whole set of vitamin is consumed uh, blindly and these days it is a very common practice as such and majority of the patients would have that neurological symptoms and very interestingly stopping that uh, vitamin supplement would help the patient to recover which is a important clue and uh, many a times uh, you need to educate the patient bit hard because the patient may not be ready to do that or the patient may not accept it so easily then when the patient come with the, that ulceration to the mouth which is common pyridoxine deficiency syndrome my prescription would be kamadva draksharista like drugs then really the other way so i don't prefer to supply pyridoxine because the dietary pyridoxine would be more than enough the every patient of ulcers in the mouth may not be a pyridoxine deficiency this also is true so most of the patients who present with the ulcers in the mouth the commonest prescription they would have is a uh, the vitamin b complex where pyridoxine is given in excess and they consume it for a long time they develop the neurological symptoms and this is how the whole vicious cycle comes in so you break down that cycle by block uh, stopping that uh, b complex and usually most of the patients recover simply because of that the withdrawal but when i prescribe kamadugan and draksharista patients would have some better feeling that's about the pyridoxine deficiency the next is uh, uh, we will continue with that deficiency in the next uh, coming session so we will stop at that next we will start with the cyanocobalamin deficiency and other deficiency conditions nutritional pathologies uh, if there are any questions i'll try to answer and then right there is one question uh, in flaxseed hemiplegia agni chikitsa then please explain agni chikitsa okay agni chikitsa is uh, one of the special uh, a, a patent sort of the treatment in uh, sdm hospital and those who are in the sdm hospital know about it uh, we have 13 varieties of the drugs Uh, seven uh, wet drugs and six uh, dry drugs added together and applied as a form of the paste and then given in it's one of the pathogenic kits which is done in sdm ayurveda hospital quite frequently in majority of the patients uh, more detail about that in this case we can discuss on some other situations later on hmm? right are there any other questions no right so then we'll wind up today